cycle. Today we will begin as we always do by slowing down, creating some sacred space and beginning with a short meditation. So please close your eyes and take in a deep breath through the nose and hold and exhale through the mouth and hold. And inhale through the nose and hold. And exhale through the mouth and hold. On each inhale, imagine yourself floating up on a wave as it comes in towards the shore. And on each exhale, imagine yourself floating down again into the trough. Up on the inhale, down on the exhale. If thoughts should come into your head, just observe them and let them pass the way you're passing over each wave. And on your next inhale, say to yourself, Shema. And on the exhale, listen. Shema, listen. In Shema, we're listening deeply without judgment, without self-criticism, and without offering advice. In Shema, we are listening with an open heart. Shema, listen. And when you're ready, you may open your eyes. Well, last week we talked about, in our first week of humility, being in that role of co-creator with the universe. And sometimes we had to step forward to be a co-creator. Sometimes we had to step back, but a lot of it just had to do with self-confidence and self-esteem and just realizing, yeah, I'm okay to participate as a co-creator. Or um, Maybe it was a way of elevating kind of mundane activities. You know, I'm co-creating these clean dishes here as I'm loading the dishwasher, as I'm washing the dishes. So I know all of you were not here, but um, I'm curious um, how this idea of co-creation sits with you. And can you think of any examples in the last week where maybe you were acting as a, as a co-creator of, of the world? Yeah, Carol. I think every time that I meet with my spirituality group and we have these wonderful, far wandering sometimes uh, discussions, um, I'm bringing together some people to think about ideas and most of the ideas are based around how to live a good Jewish life and to make the world better. So mm -hmm. I guess that's a co-creation of sort. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Spirituality and many people and deep conversations. Yes, Shelley. Uh, you know, it's funny when you asked that question, I went, oh, I didn't do anything this week. And then I was like, no, you did, dummy. <laughs> so I, uh, I, one of the favorite things I love to do is watch Gaia. And uh, they talk about the Heart Map Institution 
which ma is mapping the heart. And they have created a, um, an app for, you know, people to put on their phones. And once you join, it's kind of like a network of people who all are living in their heart space. Mm -hmm. And so they have um, things where they ask you, like, you know, at least five times a day, go into the app and time yourself and just be in your heart and give, you know, the energy into all the rest of the world to kind of connect. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of my way of connecting and bringing love back into the world. So, so yes. Great. Thank you. Greg, would you, oh, sorry. Uh, Joanne and then Carol. Got a question. Okay. So, um, my whole week is a blur and, and Tuesday I had made some follow up calls to make sure people were coming to the sisterhood meeting at 1.30, including our Rebbitson, who for the longest time hasn't been involved at all, but she has expressed that she would speak on our behalf and, and I had asked her, I guess, uh, last Saturday. And I saw her if she could come because, you know, now her kids are in school during the week. So it's not such a, you know, imposition for her to come over for a you know, few hours. And, and uh, I called her right be, like an hour before the hour and a half before the meeting and just to find out and make sure you, you are coming, right? Yes. And it was actually, I mean, it was an amazing meeting because she, First of all, was very respected by everybody at the meeting. Oh, rabbits in this and rabbits in that, and you know, you know, I don't get respect, <laughs> but she did, and and she made some great suggestions, ideas, and and you know, everybody there wants to like blow up steam and talk a lot about different things, but she actually, um, it was wonderful having her there, and so. And then I followed up and told her how wonderful it was. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, it made me feel like maybe there's a future for the sisterhood, or if not, 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 but at least she's helping and she's gonna do stuff that'll bring in the younger people. And so that was great. The next day, I went to the dollar store somewhere in my travels. Oh yeah, I got my COVID vaccine, my booster, so that was great. And I went to the dollar store to see if they had tea lights, which I couldn't find, but of course you always find something there. So I found like 12 different things. And as I was leaving, there was a woman in front of me and she had a walker plus a shopping cart full of stuff. So I said, let me get the shopping cart. I did. And uh, she said, I'm just going to go out here and, and call a cab. So I said, okay. So I went to my car. And I thought about it, thought about it. And I circled around and I said, I'll give you a lift home. She's very close by, but she's disabled. She can't really walk very well. And so, so that's my, so I did that. And that's beautiful. So thank you for those two examples, Joanne. I want to make sure everyone has a chance okay. to share, but. Uh, sure. That certainly is is creating the kind of world that I think that um, we would all like to live in, where we're helping out people who are disabled and need a hand. Absolutely, that's that's great. Thank you, Carol. You'd had a question or a I, comment? I have a question. Um, when one seeks to better oneself through learning, is that a kind of co-creation. I've been trying to learn Spanish for most of the last couple of years. I'm not doing very well. I admit it. It's very difficult, but even though I took it in high school and all that, but um, is that part of it? Just trying to do something that, that makes me maybe more useful, um, more interesting, whatever it is. Would you consider that co-creation of a kind? Well, it sounds like from the way that you're asking the question, you kind of feel like it is a kind of co-creation. Well, I do in a limited sense, mm -hmm. but where the limitation is, I don't know. I mean, if I, if I learn enough Spanish so that I can go out and have a conversation or at least 
exchange a few words with somebody who is who is who does not speak English and speak Spanish maybe I go to the store and someone's having trouble communicating and I can help then I think that's co-creation but if I'm just doing it for myself by myself I don't know that's why I'm asking if I'm putting it out there yeah I uh I don't know what do people I mean I have some thoughts but I think it's a really interesting question you know does anyone else have a perspective Joanne yeah well I think the idea of going being able to help somebody in the store or you know who doesn't speak English very well or at all I mean I think that's a kind of co-creation um there's something and I don't know if this is in Pirke Abos or something but it's like there was um there's this thing about um, the Torah of kindness is on her tongue, the woman of valor. And then they ask, what, what does that mean? And, and one of the answers is, if you're learning in order to teach, you know, someone else, that's kind, you know. I mean, but um, I find it's also like very useful because there's a lot of Hispanic people in various parts of uh, United States, and it's, you know, I like to say Buenos Dias, you know, just in their language. Thank you, Joanne. Um, I, I tend to take a very, oh, Harry, go ahead. Remember to unmute. Um, I think the ultimate co-creation is um, as, as a couple, uh, creating a baby and then raising them as a to adulthood, <laughs> parenting, you know, having the child and co-creating a mensch or a person. Sure. Which is the ultimate co-creation. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful examples. Are you, do you have an announcement for us in that regard, Harry? Or no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I think Carol, uh, getting back to Carol's question, you know, I think it's it's an interesting one. And I tend to take a very expansive view of these things, you know, because we help create the world with all of our choices. And we don't always know the way that we're going, they're going to turn out, you know, and I guess, you know, on the one hand, it's okay to just want to learn a language because it sort of feels like something you should do. And at some point choices will come up to say hello or not to hello, or maybe it's like, hey, you speak Spanish, you know, can you help us rob this store? Cause we need a Spanish speaker. So, you know, it's either one kind of create, you know, creates a very different reality. But um, I, I'm actually, you know, I've been struggling this week because I'm doing the, uh, the sermon, the Devar Torah, this Saturday, where I'm at the shul, where I'm doing my internship, and it's about Noah this week, and I've really been drawn to about a third of the of the material is on the genealogies, and it's listing names, and it's listing all of this stuff, and you know that's what I think of as the almost the filler. You know, we have the Tower of Babel and the Noah's Ark and all this stuff, and then you know all this filler. But that's where my attention's been drawn. And right towards the end, there's these two lines. It's like so and so or Terah begot Abraham, and so and so and so and so. And then the next line, Abraham or Terah begot Abraham, and so and so and so and so who begot Lot. So if you had never known this story before, you would think that Lot was going to be the main character. You know, Abram, he's just a name and a list. You don't know who, which person is going to be the one who makes a big contribution. So um, I, uh, but I, I've really struggled to kind of write, write this. And I was just thinking maybe if I had, taken upon myself or thought of myself as a co-creator in this project, I would be less, you know, I might be spinning a little bit less. So that's where I'm thinking maybe that's an opportunity um, that I have to, uh, uh, you know, take on that co-creator mantle to kind of help me with this, uh, with this task. 
Well, yes, and um, Karen just messaged me. She needed to leave unexpectedly. And Wendy sent me a note before we met that she uh, couldn't join us this week, but she misses everyone and wants to say hi. So we hope she will be able to rejoin us next week. Um, so let's, uh, let's dive in a little bit more into humility. Um, we're gonna once again, go back to the soul trait spectrum, which is how we're going to Folk for this round, this is what we'll use to define the soul traits. And here we are looking again at too little humility can lead to arrogance and too much humility can kind of lead to stepping back too much, self-debasing uh, behavior. And Alan Moranis has this wonderful phrase that he wrote, no more than my space, not less than my place. So really, we're talking about humility in, in the Jewish sense. It's, it's about finding your proper place in the universe. So with that in mind, um, uh, I would like a volunteer to read this uh, quote from uh, Rabbi Bachya Ibn Pakuda from Duties in the Heart. Paul, do you mind uh, reading? Um, I'll read all except for the person's name. You did that. Okay. You <laughs> okay. uh, all virtues and duties depend on humility. And uh, so uh, says, we did not make our brain, body, or circumstances of wealth. Considered evil to take credit for your own success and spiritual credit to the divine. Do you want me to keep hey, reading? Thank you. So let's, let's just stop there. And uh, it's a little bit shorthand-ish, the way I put those bullets on. But starting kind of with the top, all virtues depend upon humility. What is a Rabbi Bahia? Um, What's his point? Do you, do you agree with that? And what, what might he be getting at? No. Yes, Joanne. So I, I think saying all virtues begin with humility because, you know, if you're arrogant, maybe you think you are responsible for your own success and you don't credit your maker mm. with helping you attain whatever you attain. Uh, and, you know, whether you did or didn't inherit a lot or wherever your space is in life, I think that to be in the middle of that, you know, not self abasing and not arrogant, that's where you have to be to be grateful, I think, for whatever life is positive things have happened to you. I guess that's it. Yeah, thank you. So it, it can relate to gratitude, absolutely. Um, what else? What is kind of this, what did, what did you mean by, by all virtues? I think we could also think of that as all soul traits or all, all mito, to use the Hebrew word. So for those of us who've been doing this for a while, do we think that humility plays a, a central role in the most our practice? And why is that? Yeah, Carol. All learning begins with humility and admitting that you don't know. Mm. Until you can admit that you don't know, you can't open up to learn. And mm. to say, I don't know, is not a bad thing. It's just an admission of the truth, but it does take some humility. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Until we say we don't know, we can't we can't learn anything. And what about this idea that um, 
we shouldn't take credit for things. You know, I have a good job. I live in a nice house. You know, I earn a good salary. You know, I put in the work. So shouldn't I? I take the credit for that. I mean, he's giving a different position. You know, that we shouldn't. Yeah, Paul. So I find this to be really interesting, and certainly in this country at this time when we're dealing with so much of trying to uh, understand uh, structural uh, racism and being an example that, um, you know, I think back on, on my family history quite a bit uh, and how I am just very lucky for so many things. Um, uh, you know, when I was young, my mother was a single mother, was struggling, but her parents were well off and would uh, send us money regularly, which kind of kept us afloat. And uh, I was, uh, I did well, you know, my brain was not something that I constructed myself, but I did well in school because of that. And I didn't have any physical disabilities. So there were lots of things that were on my side. So I had a uh, you know, family and, uh, and some capital, you know, that was there because of my family history uh, that made it easier for, for me to make my way through the world. And that had nothing to do with me. It was all about what I inherited. It was more about what did I want to do with that? I think that's where, that's what I take away from something like this, that it's not what we have. Uh, and credit, you know, it, it certainly success is a, sometimes as, as much of a crapshoot as anything else. And also depends on what you define success as. Uh, team effort. Yeah, yeah. And Carrie was saying that it's a most things take a team effort anyway. If you don't acknowledge that, then you know that's certainly not not being very humble. Yeah. Uh, so. Yes, I'm reminded of a story of a very egotistical leader in the cor corporate world who didn't believe in giving people credit. And he said, well, the ideas just all sort of bubble up, you know, and for me to kind of recognize individual people, I'll be happy to just give the speech for the team, you know? And so uh, that doesn't that doesn't help the cause very much. It did not build a lot of loyalty or excitement. Stephanie, you look like you're percolating a little bit. Do you have any, any thoughts on this? No, okay. A lot of thoughts on it. <laughs> okay, we'll go Carol and then Harry. I one of the things I find particularly problematic is when somebody said, "I'm proud of being white, black, even Jewish." That I'm proud I'm this. Now, now you can take pride in the the ancestry, mm -hmm. but I I didn't make myself be born Jewish. I'm glad I'm Jewish. I like being Jewish, but I'm not proud I'm a Jew because I didn't do that. <laughs> that was my circumstance. I, and, and that's true. And, and also to riff a little off of what Paul says, when you're born into certain circumstances, you have certain privilege and certain advantages, and that can dictate how much you succeed. And I'll yeah. let somebody else talk. I've talked mm -hmm. about it. Thank you, Carol. Harry. Yeah, um, I don't know. This is current. I don't know. If People have been watching the um, what's been happening with the uh, infrastructure, the social infrastructure discussion in Congress. But there was a major sort of discussion between Bernie Sanders and Manchin, and Manchin is sort of keeping. He's trying to keep the uh, infra social infrastructure amount low because he doesn't want to quote unquote create what is known as an entitlement mentality. And Bernie Sanders says, we're not talking about entitlement, we're talking about minimum um, standards to help people. And so, so this is a very you know, interesting discussion about you know, giving, but not making people entitled, where you know, having certain standards, like the ability to have healthcare, certain minimal things, that's not considered entitlement. And uh, so, it's a very fascinating discussion. I'm glad it's they're discussing it, and we'll see what happens. But I guess that's sort of where you you know humility comes in, and what kind of person you are, and wanting to give and care for people that need it, or not 
or not give it, assuming that they're going to abuse it, being entitled to it. And I think that says a lot about our culture in this country. And uh, unfortunately, about where we are compared to the rest of the world. But um, just something to think about. Yeah, well, certainly we can see how other people relate to these ideas. And, you know, for me, that's always a reminder. It's like, what judgments am I making about other people? You know, yes. what judgments am I making people about people based on their judgments and their political <laughs> persuasions? Yeah. And it's, um, yeah, let's, uh, on that note, let's, let's move on because I think there's, uh, Another quote that sort of, kind of sort of uh, goes with Harry's point. Harry, would you mind reading this sentence? Yeah, um, a Torah scholar who has haughtiness of spirit deserves excommunication. And if he does not possess it, he deserves excommunication. Uh, whoever exercises mercy where strictness is required will eventually be cruel where kindness is required. That's interesting. Yeah, so we've got a couple of ideas here. Um, so what do we think? You know, maybe starting, I'll paste both in the chat. Boy, as a Torah scholar, I'm feeling a little stuck here. You know, we're all studying Torah here. So does that mean no matter what we do, we deserve to be excommunicated? You know, what does it mean that if you're what are, what are they teaching here? This is open to the group. I was just commenting to Carrie that the first one kind of reminds me of sort of a Zen koan where it's like, what? <laughs> I can think right now. So that's what I got. What? Well, let's look at the first one. So, um, why, if someone is a teacher with hiding or a scholar with haughtiness of spirit, why is that a bad thing? Especially with regard to humility, Shelley. You still need to unmute. There you go. I'd say if you're coming across as being haughtiness with spirituality, um you're in your own singularity you're not you're not seeing the broadness you're not seeing the love of everybody's light and everybody's spirit mm. and, and and therefore it's the same thing if you don't have that ability to see everybody's light and everybody's spirit then yeah then you're not really truly you know in sync with who you are and connected to the divine and so then i that that quote therefore now makes sense to me so thank you <laughs> Sure, so the, the first part, great. You know, so if you're haughty, you're not paying attention to other people. It's just about your own ideas um, and that's not proper. But then what about the other point? What if, you, what if it means, well, if you don't have some haughtiness of spirit, you also deserve excommunication. <laughs> so why is it bad not to have haughtiness of spirit? Yeah, Joanne. Maybe that's like the um, self abnegating or, you know, not even recognizing what you do have. Mm. And so maybe for that reason, or appreciating it. Yeah, that's a good start. Let's let's go. Let's let's take that a little bit further. So maybe some of it has to do with not recognizing or appreciating what you have or being a little too self-negating. Why is it bad to be self-negating if you're a Torah scholar? Carol, you were a teacher. Could you just go dormant your way through the year every year? No, it's important to have some confidence and uh, to, to have confidence that what you're teaching has value. Mm. Yeah, Carrie. I was thinking of the imposter syndrome. If you oh. don't have some haughtiness, um, you might get, might negate yourself with, with that 
that syndrome and you know, not realize that you really are talented or, or a good teacher or whatever. Yeah, yeah beautiful. Both of those ideas take care of uh, for both, uh, both you and Carol. Yeah, it's really about, you know, if you don't believe in what you're teaching, if you don't think you're sort of worthy of teaching this, who's, who's going to listen to you? Mm. And, you know, if you're, or who's going to, you know, how are you going to kind of absorb like the wisdom that's in the Torah, you know, if you don't feel like you're worthy of it. So it's really, again, it's finding that right, that right place in the, uh, in the midst. So if you're, you're out there, you gotta have some like, oomph, you gotta have some verve, you know, it's not, it's about finding that, that middle way. All right, so let's look at that second one then. Which again, I'm gonna open my chat again. Whomever exercises mercy where strictness is required. So let's just break it down phrase by phrase again. What would it mean? to exercise mercy where strictness is required. No. Yes, Joanne. So to me, it's like letting someone get away with murder or getting, getting a much easier you know, sentence than they really deserve based on what they did. Mm. Yeah, so maybe it's not it's not um, properly dispensing uh, with justice. You know, it's sort of like okay, you know, well you've you've learned your lesson, or you know, well it's not really my problem, or you know, I'm, it's going to be a lot of work to discipline my kids, so I'm just going to you know watch TV instead. Yeah, Carol. I'm going to use a horse example because it's simpler than people. I ride this horse Smokey and he sometimes doesn't like other horses and he'll go after them. Now, if I allow Smokey to do that and don't sit on him right away and let him know that's not acceptable, sooner or later he's going to hurt somebody and he's somebody's going to have to really beat him up mm. or get him out of the yard because it becomes a danger. I think the same is true with, with people. Um, children particularly you let the child get away with everything and pretty soon he goes out and does something really bad and then you know you beat him up or whatever so um, it's knowing how to balance that strictness and knowing how to balance you know the kindness and, and yeah. there's often not a reason to be cruel you know like I say when I'm working with the horses most of the time when a horse misbehaves he's either frightened or in pain or confused but if a horse is going after another horse, he's not confused. Yeah. He's misbehaving. Yeah, so one tweak I would add to what you're saying is that you're talking about sort of the consequences for the kid or for the horse that they're going to get beaten up. But the way it's written, it's that we will be the ones dispensing the cruelty. So why is it that if I'm not setting a boundary properly or if I'm not being strict, I'm gonna end up being cruel? Yeah, Paul? So the one part of this that would make sense to me is that if I am dispensing uh, or you know, exercising mercy where strictness is required, I have a certain, I think I would have a certain expectation that that dispensing of mercy would be uh, reciprocated in some way and that I will become resentful so that when that same person let's say uh, is doing something where uh, in actual fact mercy or kindness is required I may not be able to feel that because of all of the uh, you know, the if, if I wasn't doing the right thing in the first place or, or appropriately doing that it, I would that my resentment would come out as cruel <laughs> instead. That's... Yeah, yeah. So sometimes we get resentful and uh, we get harsh. I shared this with a bunch of uh, college students in the spring, and they really resonated with this. And I remember one young man. He's like, "Oh yeah, it's like with my roommates where." 
you know, if my roommate like really leaves a mess in the apartment and I'm really, really mad and I wanna kind of yell at them about it, but then uh, I'm not being a chill person. So I just won't say anything at all. But then like a month later, like something will happen and they're gonna need my help. And I'm gonna be like, sorry, you know, I'm busy. I'm not gonna help you. And he realized that, well, if I just like calmly said, hey, can you clean your things up? You know, I can still be a chill person and ask them to, to do their part. And I don't have like this resentment that's building up in me. So that then down the road, you know, I won't kind of act like a jerk when, when maybe they need my help. So I thought that was a great, a great example for how, um, you know, again, sort of walking that, that middle path, you know, we have to be bold enough to just ask for what we need sometimes. And without it get, causing so much anxiety or anger or whatever that we stay silent. And then, um, yeah, does that make sense? All right. Now, next we have a quote that's, oops, I didn't share, I don't think. So let's take this a step further because really this is about how we show up in the world. So this is a still from the movie Making of a Mensch by Tiffany Schlein. I'm just curious, has anybody seen that? It's like this great 10 minute, 10 minute short film about, uh, about Musa and character. So she quotes um, Rabbi Simcha Bonham, who's taught that we should each go through the world with two notes in our, our pockets. In one pocket, there's a note, the whole world was created for me. And then the other note, there's a pocket, uh, there's a note that says, I'm only dust and ashes. And when our head starts to swell with self-importance, we take out the I'm only dust and ashes note. And when we're feeling maybe a little down in the dumps or unsure, um, we take out the whole world was created for me note. So um, we're gonna talk about this, I believe a little bit. Yeah, we'll maybe just, you know, with that in mind, we'll, we'll go to some early, early breakout groups today to really think about that, um, these ideas. And uh, sorry, my uh, Zoom game is not totally plugged in today. Here we go. So when we get together with our partners, I'd love for you to kind of check in with where you are and how you're doing and share where you kind of sit along the humility spectrum and then maybe for a challenge that you're facing right, right now, what is a note that you need? I will uh, stop the share and in the chat, I will share that, um, share the instructions and then we will uh, start to open the breakout rooms. Okay, so the rooms are open. I will see you back in a few minutes. For those of you that are on the stream, this is gonna be it for today. Please, uh, if you like this, please like the video. And come by AmericanMusar.com to sign up for our weekly uh, reminder email that comes out and the bi-weekly newsletter, which introduces each soul trait we're going to be focusing on. Till then, uh, wishing you a wonderful day, week, and year. Here we go. Thank you. 
So welcome back, everyone. So I'm curious, what, um, what insights did you have? How are your conversations? And which node do you think might be most helpful to you for where you are with a particular challenge? Who would like to share? Yeah, Stephanie. Well, I have to admit my mood has been a little down lately because I had a bad fall last Monday. Mm. And so I just kept identifying with I am but dust and ashes, I guess, because as much as I, you know, feel like superwoman sometimes or just, you know, that I'm getting back to an exercise program and eating better and and, um, you know, feeling really good uh, and feeling like I'm uh, watching <laughs> where I'm going. And I, I just, you know, it just was an accident that happened. I didn't look down, my foot slipped into a jacket that was on the ground and I didn't know what it was that had happened. I thought I'd I stepped on an animal or something. So I just went down and I don't even know if there could have been any way to, um, to prevent that. I mean, I'm taking a Tai Chi class that, that I thought was gonna help me with my balance. And, and, you know, I just thought, what the hell? I'm not like, I didn't do so well. I just like, you know, went splat on the, on the ground. So I just, I don't know, I, maybe it's just, where I'm at emotionally and it hurts and and I don't know how long um, it's going to take to heal but I did um, uh, I mean I'm a good thing about working at home is that I can hop into the bed and place it um, in between classes and um, but anyway um, I can walk and that's a blessing so but just I, I could only kind of identify with I am but dust and ashes, which um, I don't know if that's a positive thing or not, but that's where I was at. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that, Stephanie. And I'm really listening with an open heart. And it sounds both physically and kind of emotionally painful to go through that, you know, and I really hear that in your story. And is it okay if I ask you a question? Sure. Yeah, so I totally understand why that really feels like a dust and ashes moment. And if we look at Rabbi Sim, uh, Simcha Bunim's teaching, it's like in those moments, we want to take out the the world was created for me note. Mm -hmm. So if you were to take that out of your pocket and look at it, what, what might that tell you? Where might you be able to find ways in which the world is created for you to help you and maybe it wouldn't be helpful, but maybe it would be. So where where might you find the world yeah. created for you? I I mean, I am a, a spiritual person and mm -hmm. I do believe in a higher power. And the fact that I didn't break anything mm -hmm. makes me feel like somebody was watching out for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it could have been a lot worse. Mm -hmm. And um and I had a doctor when I was very young that said, um, because my parents um, died very young. And so I felt that that was going to be my direction in life. And he told me that um, you could outlive your, your, both your parents, that the body has a tremendous ability to heal itself. Mm. And if you take care of yourself, um, you know, you'll outlive both of your parents. So I sort of grew up with that in my head most of my life. And yeah. so, um, yeah, I mean, I think if I just realize that I have been lucky, well, maybe not, I don't know if it's luck, but that I have been blessed many times in my life, even though sometimes I don't recognize it. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, uh, Shelly, how is this 
how's this showing up for you? So, you know, it's, it's interesting because when you just posed that question to her, but you took the positive side to her moment of reflection and, and having, you know, her internal pain that she's been going through, you made her see that positive side. And, and so it, it automatically started making me think, that, okay, I think I was reading that question from before differently. I was taking my positive sides and I was looking at the positive part going, I don't understand, you know, but you clarified it for me right there in the sense that, you know, it's, it's in those moments of our, our, our darker points where we're in our shadow that if we can look at ourselves and say, yes, the world is made for me, you know, then you can see the possibilities. And, you know, when you're in that high of all the possibilities to also say, to be humble as mm -hmm. what we're talking about is humility to say, I might have all this stuff and be blessed and have created this path for me. And thank you universe. If, if you were also part of it, um, you know, giving me the choices, but at the same time, at some point I will just be dust and ashes. So you, you can be show the gratitude for everything that you have and for others. So thank you. That's uh, brilliant. Well, you're very welcome. You know, at some point in the book, I don't remember if it was this chapter or another one, I think I shared that when my first book came out, I was uh, right. I wrote it as a serial on my old website. And so each one I would post on Twitter and other places. And, you know, I was, I was addicted to how many website visitors I got. And I think I got like a thousand visitors for this one post. And it was really mm -hmm. like puffed up. And then I got on Twitter and I started I said something to someone who I don't didn't know, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but the immediate response is, well, you're an ass. And uh, I really needed the dust and ashes note at that point, because I was very mm -hmm. pumped up and I needed to mm -hmm. be like, all right, you know, tone it down a little bit, you know, because mm -hmm. I didn't. Um, and who wants to take out the dust and ashes note when we're mm -hmm. feeling really good and everything's going our way? <laughs> but uh, we can spare ourselves maybe some unnecessary pain. And I, I was so upset. I was furious. Mm -hmm. that, you know, this person called me an ass. And then like mm -hmm. years have gone by. I'm like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was kind of an ass. Mm -hmm. wasn't a malicious ass but I was an ass yeah yeah um uh Nancy were you gonna say something or was that Joanne I couldn't see Joanne Joanne you... yeah yeah so I had that kind of moment recently because I um am in this group of women who say to helium and we each take a certain number of them the, the woman who's running it each, you know, portions to each us, of us, and then it rotates as through time. So we each are reading eventually the whole thing. And um, it turned out on Tuesday, I found out the rabbi's class that used to be on Monday, he switched to Tuesday. And now it was going to interfere with this other group. And I wrote him a text about it. I, I was on his class and then I left time to get on the other thing and and this is partly his fault too but but i my phone rang and while i was in the women's to healing group and we had started or you know we say an opening prayer and then we say a psalm and then we say a closing prayer and usually i'm the one who reads a whole list of people that we're, we're wishing praying for the for the healing and we were just getting started and my phone rang and I saw it was the rabbi. So I think I got up from the computer and went in the kitchen, but I was, I forgot to mute myself. And, you know, so Constance, the woman who runs the program, you know, said that was very rude and disruptive or some such judgmental thing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like it though. I realized that, yeah, it wasn't too good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and then I, but I wrote to her later and I said, but, you know, you could have muted me as the host. And, uh, you know, but this is, and, you know, I also felt, because it had a, a ring of years and, you know, a long time ago when I was in graduate school in 1983, um, 
I don't know if I bumped into someone who was very crowded and, and the other person was, oh, you're rude, you know, like in a very haughty and snippy mm -hmm. way. And I never forgot that, mm -hmm. you know, like, what about you? You know, you bumped into me too. Yeah, I but um, I didn't say anything, you know, because I just took it because I didn't know how to deal with those things. But um, and this had a reverberation of that. I, I kind of told her, but I haven't heard back, and I guess it doesn't really matter. Yeah. It is what it was. And, uh, hey, the world was created again. for you, Joanne. That's just you know. Hey, you're rude. Hey, I'm. I, the world was created for me. This is my space right here. Right. You know? But um, yeah, those are painful occurrences. You know, I was yeah. making a little joke about it, but I didn't mean to make light of your um, your experience. And thank yeah. you for sharing that. Okay. We're a little bit over, but before we go, I I am going to share. Oops, I got to do something before I share this. Sorry. Oh, I think. Sorry, I um, here is what I'm looking for. I wanted to just, uh, and I'll put this in the chat. We have our mantra and our actions. So for the mantra, I suggest the one from Alan Moranis, no more than my place, not less than my space. You could write a different one. We, we've been talking about kind of holding that middle, that middle ground between, you know, haughtiness and haughtiness for the Torah scholar, understanding the right time and place, and also picking an action, like maybe speaking up a little more or less, um, changing where you sit or how you dress, engaging in self-care. So, you know, like parking considerately you know, in terms of no more than your space, no less than your place. And singing can also be just a great way of uh, connecting with something higher. Rev Nachman of Breslau said that singing is a great way to connect with the divine. And Americans sometimes can be really bashful about singing. So, uh, you know, feeling, uh, you know, letting our, our song shine a little bit. So with that, let's do a quick closing meditation. Close your eyes and take in a deep breath through the nose and hold. And exhale through the mouth and hold. Again, inhale through the nose and hold. And exhale through the mouth and hold. Just imagine yourself for a moment walking down the sidewalk in a crowd of people. Sometimes you're moving to the side to let them through. But sometimes you're just walking and letting them move out of your way. Sometimes it's appropriate for us to step aside but it's not always appropriate for us to be the one stepping aside. Sometimes we need to hold our ground and let other people step aside. And just feel yourself walking calmly, just naturally making the right decision without second guessing yourself. being okay with whatever happens. Now tilt your head back and let your jaw open and smile. And take a moment of gratitude and some thanks to the other souls who shared this journey with you today. And when you're ready, you may open your eyes. Well, friends, thank you so much for being here. 
next week we shall begin on the soul trade of patience. Um, oh, I didn't talk about schedule. If you will indulge me for just a moment, I want to make sure. Oh, shoot. Next week, actually, we will not be meeting. The next two weeks, we will not be meeting because I'm flying to see each of my daughters um, for their respective parents' weekends. So, um, sorry, I should have double checked that earlier. Um, but um, I will send out an email reminder next week that we won't be meeting and I'll look forward to seeing you all in, uh, in three weeks. Till then, bye-bye.